Why are some spaceflight companies so secretive, and why are others so open? The idea for this video came from a question of a viewer who wrote, What's up with Blue Origin secrecy? I wrote a short answer that I didn't like, wrote some more, and pretty soon realized that the topic deserved a video of its own. We'll start with SpaceX, because they started the openness trend. As is often the case, we need to roll the calendar back a few years, to 2007. SpaceX and Kistler Aerospace had been awarded NASA contracts to fly cargo, and perhaps someday crew, to the International Space Station. This was a critical need as the shuttle was going to be retired in three years. The Kistler K-1 was intended to be a fully reusable vehicle, with the first stage boosting to the launch site and landing with parachutes and airbags, and the second stage using a similar approach. Kistler had been working on the design since 1994, and NASA liked Kistler because it was run by George Mueller, the head of the Office of Manned Spaceflight during the 1960s. At the time of the award, SpaceX had performed one test launch of its Falcon 1 rocket, which failed at 33 seconds into the flight. Both of these were speculative vehicles. At this time period, what was SpaceX's biggest barrier to success? Was it that people might steal Falcon 9 technology and duplicate it? With the possible exception of the Merlin engine, which was still in early development, Falcon 9 was a really boring rocket. Deliberately so. Who would steal that? SpaceX had a bigger problem. Falcon 9 was a big step up from Falcon 1, and it used a ridiculous 9 engines on the first stage. Plus, they were building a capsule. And the company was run by a guy who made his money doing internet stuff. Conventional wisdom was that they would fail. SpaceX had a PR problem. To be successful, they needed not only to keep NASA happy with their progress, they needed to be able to sell to commercial satellite companies, and they really wanted to get some of the Air Force money that ULA had a monopoly on at the time. In short, they needed people to take them seriously. And somebody had an interesting idea. What if we just do everything in the open? With the first Falcon 9 launch, we got tracking views and multiple onboard cameras. That wasn't unprecedented. ULA did that for Atlas V, but it was a sign that SpaceX was interested in being open. We got nice live shots during the first operational flight, CRS-1, but it was frankly footage that only a rocket nerd could love. And then somebody decided to raise the bar. Verify, go for launch. Go for launch. Rock, verify, range, go. RC, this is Rock on Countdown Net. Range green. Five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff. Liftoff of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Launching Dragon to the International Space Station and returning cargo resupply missions to U.S. soil. Starting gravity turn. SpaceX, as a private company and our partner, produced what you saw tonight. That's American industry at its best. Stage separation confirmed. And back in stage two performance is good. Dragon deploy confirmed. Copy. Dragon is in orbit. Solar array deployment has started. It looks like we got two arrays. I would agree with that. And station on two, capture complete. Looks like we've tamed the dragon. We're happy she's on board with us. A lot of cargo. We started taking stuff out. Some of the white bags right behind me is all the cargo. This is a, a crew care package, which brought, which we got. Um, we also got a little dessert, just like you said. Got a little ice cream.
That is an absolutely wonderful video. Great camera work, great views, great music, and wonderful production all around. And most importantly for SpaceX, a great advertisement for the company and Falcon 9. It reminds me a little of The Dream is Alive, a wonderful IMAX movie about the space shuttle from way back in 1986. And then came CRS-2, and launches had become a full production. We got an intro video at the start of the webcast, and multiple technical experts to explain and narrate what was going on and why we should care about it. SpaceX had made space launches interesting and exciting. And then, at some point, we ended up with more great video feeds and the sort of overlay graphics you see on major sports broadcasts. SpaceX got a ton of benefits from this approach. First, there is implicit understanding among potential customers that Falcon 9 is the real deal. Commercial and Air Force payload people have already seen what SpaceX can do. Second, this makes for easier relationships with Congress, who holds the purse strings for NASA. A U.S. company doing cool things in space is a very useful talking point for politicians. Third, recruitment. The high-quality launch videos make it much, much easier to recruit people to come work at SpaceX. Fourth, the SpaceX Army. People who like spaceflight, but had frankly become bored with the shuttle program. SpaceX defined Spaceflight 2.0. SpaceX doesn't need to do conventional public relations work because the openness works so well. A few years later, Rocket Lab followed in SpaceX's footsteps. Being a company with a small rocket they launch out of New Zealand, they needed as much help as possible. Their first flight, Launch Day Video, is wonderfully produced. So why isn't everybody taking this approach? The answer is simple. It's a major pain. The first pain is ITAR, the International Traffic in Arms Regulations, which is intended to prevent U.S. technology from falling into the wrong hands. It's a complex document. Most space companies are subject to Category 4, launch vehicles, guided missiles, ballistic missiles, rockets, torpedoes, bombs, and mines, or Category 15, spacecraft and associated equipment, or maybe both. For this discussion, we aren't concerned about export restrictions in selling things to other countries. We care about the prohibition in sharing technical data. And yes, I saw it in a video you sent out, or I saw it in a video somebody else sent out, counts as sharing. There are exclusions. Information that is in the public domain, fundamental research, and educational information are excluded. So here's the problem. This is an extremely high-resolution picture of the three versions of Raptor. Does it fall under ITAR or not? If you want to be open about what you're doing, these sorts of questions are going to come up over and over. And Starship has attracted people whose full-time job is watching what SpaceX is doing at Starbase from ground cameras or from the air. SpaceX has to make sure that that access does not lead to ITAR violations. And ITAR has some real teeth. Criminal charges can result in fines up to $1 million per incident and imprisonment for up to 20 years. That means you need people who are dedicated to working to limit the amount of exposure you have and people who know who to apologize to in the cases where the process goes wrong. The second issue is protecting your intellectual property. There are two main ways to do this. In a patent, you describe your invention and then you have legal protection against anybody using your idea without licensing it for a period of 20 years, at least in the countries where you hold a patent. It's expensive, but provides very good protection. Your other option is a trade secret. In that case, you just don't tell anybody about what you want to protect. It's cheap and easy, but if you accidentally disclose the secret or somebody just figures it out and starts using it, you have no protection. That would seem to make patents the approach of choice, but there's a problem. The problem is that while China is a signatory to international patent treaties, their patent trial and appeal board is set up to further the aims of the Chinese government. They also follow a first-to-file approach rather than first-to-develop. That means you can show up in China and find out that not only have they stolen your IP, they've patented it in China, preventing you from even selling your product there. Given this, what would we expect to find for the patent behavior of launch companies? Let's play a little game. 
I went out and looked at the number of patents for a number of different space companies. Your job is to guess which company has a specific number of patents. All of these companies have a considerable amount of intellectual property that they want to protect, and the number of granted patents can give us some insight into how they approach that problem. We start at six patents, and that belongs to Firefly. Up next at 10 patents is Stoke. 11 patents go to Rocket Lab, but some of those are from companies that they acquired. Three companies who aren't really using patents. Next up with 35 patents is Relativity, and 36 for ULA. We'd kind of expect that for ULA with them being a slightly older company. Only two companies left, 87 patents for SpaceX, and 172 go to Blue Origin. Elon Musk is famously against patents because of the Chinese issues, so that number was surprising. But there are a few things to note about the kind of patents. The relativity ones are almost exclusively about additive manufacturing. For SpaceX, there was one patent for the Merlin engine, one patent for COPV pressure vessels, and from what I can tell, all the rest of them are Starlink. My interpretation of the approach that Relativity and SpaceX are taking is that they decided that the competitive benefits of patenting them in countries that follow patents was more important than the disclosure of the ideas to China. That gives us Blue Origin as an extreme outlier in the patent world, generating far more than the others. Some people have noted that it's better to consider Blue Origin to be a think tank than a rocket company, and from that perspective their desire to patent makes a bit more sense. The final pain about being open is public company requirements. If you're a public company like Rocket Lab, you are subject to rules around how and when you disclose material information. If you do it wrong, you may be hearing from the Securities and Exchange Commission. And even if you do it right, you may be subject to a shareholder lawsuit. Those are all the downsides, and that's why work out in the open isn't as easy as it sounds. The new space launch companies all mostly land on the more information side. The old space companies are generally not that open. Most of them predate the widespread availability of the internet, and in the old days there was really no way to tell the people who might care about what you were doing. So that became the default model. One exception is ULA, with Tori Bruno posting fairly often on Twix, and ULA has also posted some nice videos. The old space companies often work with the military and the so-called three-letter agencies like the NSA. That work is always classified, and it's easier to not say anything than to put effort into figuring out what you are actually allowed to say. Which finally brings us to Blue Origin, and you might have wondered why it was listed as an old space company. Blue Origin has a weird history for a new space company, where most companies are run by their founders. From 2003 to 2018, Rob Meyerson was running things, and he oversaw the development of New Shepard and the growth of the company from 10 employees to 1,500 employees. In 2018, Meyerson left the company and was replaced by Bob Smith. Smith was a vice president at Honeywell Aerospace, one of the big old space companies. He was a bit of a strange choice, an old space executive coming to a company that had previously been more new space in culture. He instituted an old space mentality through the company. In 2023, Bezos decided to replace Smith with Dave Limp, who was Senior Vice President for Devices and Services at Amazon and in charge of, among other things, Amazon's Project Kuiper Satellite Internet Constellation. I think there are three big factors in Blue Origin's secrecy. The first is that Bob Smith brought the old space secrecy to the company. I think they've been a little more open in the past few years, but I think secrecy is still their natural response. Second, I think that things work the way Jeff Bezos wants them to work, and he wants secrecy. He chose Bob Smith knowing what Honeywell was like, and kept him on for five years. Third, Blue Origin hasn't had a lot of opportunities to show their work beyond New Shepard flights, as we have only seen one New Glenn flight. Perhaps they will become more open when they have more to show. I've talked about this as if there are just two choices, working in the open or keeping things secret. But companies exist all along the continuum based on how they evaluate the trade-offs. And it's common for companies to be more open on one project than on other projects. 
This same sort of thing goes on at NASA. If you've ever read any of the space shuttle mission reports, you note that NASA put a lot of effort into making sure they followed their congressional openness mandate and shared their information widely. That is unfortunately not the case in the Artemis era, where there has been a concerted effort to hide issues and operate in ways that make it difficult to get information, even if you can make FOIA or Freedom of Information Act requests. Despite Artemis I being the first flight of a new launcher that NASA had been working on for well over a decade, NASA did not create a detailed mission report for Artemis I, and we only know about issues because of the work of the NASA Office of the Inspector General and the General Accounting Office. This is frankly a shame. And that's what's driving openness and secrecy at space companies. If you enjoyed this video, here's your song of the day.